that entire architecture is is built around the requirements that deliver suitable, effective, and survivable material candidate solutions and material solutions really that are that end state, that product that the warfighter is going to take. And all that's transparent to them. It should be transparent to them. They shouldn't be thinking about that when they're in a foxhole. They shouldn't be thinking about that when they're getting ready to do an airborne op. It's like, I have a piece of materiel, it's sound, and I'm going to survive if I use it to close with and destroy the enemy. This is Dan Magee, CEO of Firestorm, and this week on the Drone Wars podcast, we have Lieutenant Colonel Brabs, aka Michael Brabner, the Air Branch Chief of the U.S. Army. This is a really awesome podcast this week. Uh, Brabs and I have been texting and online buddies for almost a year now, so it's nice to meet him IRL. And we go into a lot of different aspects of like his career and how it shaped what he's trying to accomplish as he's getting ready to kind of leave the DOD after you know a couple decades of service here. He's got a thesis, and the thesis really is that drones are gonna change the war, and if we don't adapt, we will lose the next war. Brabs, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm excited to talk all things UAS with you. Mm -hmm. uh, tell everybody a little bit about who you are and yep. what you do. Okay. Um, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. I have uh, 14 years of operational experience, all in light infantry, uh, spanning from jobs all the way from a uh, soldier rifleman all the way up to uh, battalion S3. Uh, have a rifle company command uh, deployment with uh, 227 Charlie Company out of uh, the 25th Infantry Division in Afghanistan up in RC East, uh, Kunar Province. Platoon leader time in the 101st uh, Airborne um, with 2nd Brigade Combat Team. Um, during the surge in uh, Baghdad. And uh, at the 14 year mark of my career, uh, my acquisition mentor told me, he's like, hey, you know, you can keep chugging along in the infantry or you can go into acquisition. And I was like, well, what's acquisition? And he's like, think of it this way. He goes, you get involved with major programs. Um, you can be a part of doing capability development, material development, and you can field systems to the warfighter that make them 10, time more 10 times more deadly. So think along the lines of like Kalashnikov, right? So he goes, you get involved with the right systems. He goes, you can be responsible for helping our warfighters kill a lot of bad dudes. And that really appealed to me. So jumped in acquisition in uh, 2014, done every job across the uh, acquisition life cycle from JSIDs, which is requirements, science and technology, uh, worked on about six cross-functional teams um, in that time. I uh, did my program management time at uh, Joint Program Executive Office, uh, Armaments and Ammunition mm -hmm. up in Picatinny, the home of uh, Lethality mm -hmm. uh, for all of the joint forces. And um, did operational test command for about four years uh, out at Fort Hood. So being a test officer, running IOT and E, FOTs, you know, uh, operational assessments for compact semi-automatic sniper rifles, striker ATGM, uh, tank rounds, mission command, uh, C2 systems, and then... Um, Towards the tail end of my career, the opportunity came to go to Fort Benning, mm -hmm. uh, now Fort Moore. Uh, it's my fifth time back there, um, you know, from private to second lieutenant, first lieutenant, company commander or captain. And then um, now back as lieutenant colonel, close out my career in uh, robotics requirements uh, division. So I am the air branch chief. I'm not a naval chief, uh, just air branch chief by nature. And we are responsible for writing all the new emerging requirements under the joint small UAS uh, capabilities development document strategy for the army. So what that means, it's all group one and group two systems. And I think that's really why you invited me on to talk about that. Absolutely. But it's important to understand your background. And yeah. I think probably some of the stuff you experienced in places like Afghanistan, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show, um, you told me you wish you'd had some of the systems we have today. Talk yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah. So a lot of people, um, like I'm genuinely passionate about what I do. I'm genuinely, anybody that's ever been under, under my command or, um, in a unit with me knows that I first and foremost care about the warfighter. And, um, I've been there like, why do we have this? Why did we get fielded this? So as an acquisition officer, I have the opportunity with my team to write requirements and shape the material development piece. So, um, what we try to do is codify the end user's voice in those requirements. Like what, what capability gaps are we trying to close? Like what, 
capability do they need and want, not what they're just going to be given. Right. So, um, carried a lot of, um, uh, caskets covered in American flags day and night, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. And, um, that's something I will absolutely not stand for. And that's why it like keeps me going, uh, so hard with my team day in and day out, you know, working 15, 18 hour days, working days off, um, because this work is so important. And right now we're at a point of inflection in our history where we are so close to being on the tip of changing our culture with regards to small UAS, you know, everything it was supposed to be and wasn't during the global war on terrorism. And as we watch uh, world events unfold in multiple theaters right now, it is so apparent that if we don't fix ourselves, we're going to find out. And I don't want to be there responsible for the finding out piece. I want to make the other enemy personnel die for their country. Um, in the most violent, catastrophic, uh, decisively overmatching and overwhelming way possible. So in the last couple of years, what have we learned and, you know, by conflicts where these, these systems are being deployed in mass, how have you kind of applied that to what needs to change within the army? Yeah. So, uh, anybody with a telegram account for the last four years can just, you know, you can wake up and be on your phone from sunrise to sunset and into the wee hours of the morning when the sun rises again. Right. Um, taking all those open closed source intelligence, uh, reports, lessons learned, vignettes, training, um, training procedures, tactics, techniques, procedures, uh, doctrinal changes, uh, materiel changes, uh, technology maturation, as far as weapon systems go and the employment of those small UAS capabilities, taking all those lessons learned and not letting this go in one ear and out the other, right? Like, Hey, let's actually process this in the meat computer between our ears. Right. And, um, turn that into something like a requirements document. And I brought, I brought all the ones that we currently have right now. It's about an inch and a half thick, um, stack of papers, but this is like the, the baseline work you have to do. It's foundational. Like you have to do this because this is the user's voice. Like I didn't write these all myself. These are subject matter experts from across the army, across SOCOM, you know, MARSOC, USASOC, special missions units, um, army innovation labs, um, chief technical officers, uh, in, in industry advising and assisting so that we kind of shorten the knowledge or flatten the knowledge curve and get after the true codification and verification and validation of requirements documents to arm our program managers with the very document they need to go out and get money through the PPB process, the SPAR process, the POM process, because money rules the day, um, especially in fiscally constrained uh, environments. So if you don't have a requirements document, do not pass go, do not collect $200, no program or record, and that's no capability. So that's what my team does. How, how long did it take you to put that together? Um, I think right now, um, I came in July 1st, uh, 2022. Uh, Colonel now retired. Rob Ryan hired me into the job. I think we've got five documents now and trying to have eight uh, before August when I retire. Um, and then my, my follow-on air branch chief that we got hired, he'll be coming in like the June, July timeframe. Mm -hmm. He's going to take it from here and then he's going to take it up to the next plateau. And then we're just going to start working this system. Uh, within JSIDs, making documents and going after money and then delivering capability and learning from that capability we deliver to the warfighter. So mm -hmm. we get better at this and it's going to be very cyclic. It's going to ebb and flow like the tides, right? Um, and that's how this process is supposed to work. What do you think needs to happen cyclically for this to be successful, right? Yeah. Well, you gotta, you gotta exercise some tactical patience, right? Everybody, like if we could, if, if we had the stomach for fielding a new capability every six months or every year, what's the training cost with that, right? So if, if you're constantly overburdening a unit with new capability, they have to take time away to train it. Mm -hmm. um, so can we seek capability? Can they integrate it? Can they innovate with it? And then can they adapt with it in combat? Mm -hmm. And if we're learning those lessons learned, I realistically think that like our window to turn is like 36 months. And I say 36 months because three years give you, gives you enough time to field it, train it, employ it, deploy with it, right? And then back feed the system to the point of origin, which is requirements. So in our, every one of our documents, we put in a 36 month refresh rate. Mm -hmm. um, it comes in the uh, program product improvement plan or P3I paragraph four of every one of our annexes to the joint small US capabilities development document. Said It says, these requirements shall be updated every 36 months or as needed based on tech maturation or enemy threat system advancement. Mm -hmm. So if you find out that a, a pacing threat or a peer or near peer or non-state actor is outpacing us. Hey, we go back to the drawing board, we assess, 
uh, we rejuvenate the document, we upgrade it, and then we we staff that already approved document with the with the upgraded changes to it. And now we're in that 36 month window. And that's also a good industry too, because it gives industry opportunity to see what's coming out. And we don't have historical program records that go 10, 20, 30 years. Um, one, it's not fair, and two, it's not you're not you're not accountable to the warfighter. So things no. things change. And for uh, sure. Um, General George established a new precedent when he came in as the new chief of staff of the army and said, Hey, Shadow's not cutting it, Raven's not cutting it. And he dropped the he dropped the hammer and killed him <laughs> with one foul swoop. And that was a catalyst for us to say, Hey, be active listeners, let's change. And we were already, we already had this document architecture in place. And now we're like, that was our signal to, hey, we're doing the right thing. Let's keep doing it and let's share it now with others. Yeah. So let's talk about the pace of change, right? Because this isn't GWAT. You guys yeah. aren't fighting dudes in flip flops and caves, and yeah. maybe that's being pejorative, but you get the point. Yeah. What like? I mean, this is potentially going to be a near peer fight. I mean, we're seeing the world yeah. break into these blocks. How different is the pace of change now than it was when you first got into the acquisition role all those years ago? Um, it's very tectonic. You know, I always use the phrase. It's um, it's like glacier racing. Um, so where can you, where can you speed up? Where can you go fast? Right. It's like, it's like anything, where can you assume risk mm. and you only assume risk by mitigating risk. Mm. Um, so what we're doing here is we're mitigating a lot of risk with, uh, with these documents. We're adding in a, an adaptive, flexible framework cool. to a process that has been very rigid mm. in the past. And based on lessons learned over the last 12 years of being an acquisition professional said, Hey, where are the seams? Where do those exist? And where can they be exploited? not breaking the rules, not lying, cheat or, cheating or stealing or anything, but how can we use the power of words on paper mm. to mean something and then get it into this framework and start, mm. start rejuvenating it, rejuvenating it. Drone Wars is recorded from Firestorm's global headquarters in San Diego, California. Each episode is filmed inside our Excel a modular industrial grade manufacturing facility designed to be deployed anywhere in the world within 24 hours for on-demand drone production. Each week on the podcast, we bring you cutting edge insights from unmanned industry leaders. Listen as they share the breakthroughs and technologies they're working on, the hard lessons they've learned, and the bold predictions about what the next five to 10 years in unmanned systems and advanced manufacturing have in store for us enjoying the show so far? Then be sure to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Now back to the show. So let's talk a little bit about this for a second. You had a post recently where you shared a graphic about breaking the requirements rigidity cycle, Yeah. right? Can you walk us through this concept and how it applies to the development and deployment of next gen UAS? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I have a lot of friends, uh, up at Picatinny, they do, you know, 3d printing added manufacturing. It's, you're no stranger to that process. Mm -hmm. So typically when you just print on the X and Y axis, it's very weak structurally. Right. Um, so let's incorporate the Z axis and that's what we've done, uh, with Picatinny for like our, uh, our audible lethal mod mission payload, uh, that we developed. It's no different than a rigidity cycle, right? So you see that the diagram, it's kind of like a two lane highway. It's very elastic. It's flexible, but one side has to do the work to feed the other side. And then in the, in the, uh, the diagram I made on one side, you have army futures command and on the other, you have big defense acquisition or assault, right? Which is, um, program managers, product managers, dev comms, uh, the whole realm, right? On our end, army futures command, the number one pacing item we do and what is my job is to do requirements. Mm -hmm. This feeds the entire system. Mm -hmm. So if you look at acquisition in terms of the alpha creation and the omega, the delivery of material capability, you got to start at conception with requirements and you have to do the work. And it's, it's not an easy job, but if you do the job, it makes everything else so much easier because with a requirement, then you can go get appropriations, you can get obligations, you can get funding for programs. And then if you have an adaptive framework where you're upgrading these uh, requirements, you stay ahead of like you ebb and flow like tides based on need, based on new tech that's out mm -hmm. there, new software, mm -hmm. new lethality, mm -hmm. um, or enemy pacing threats, um, whoever they are, whatever they may be, um, countermeasures, you know, they're, they're taking that out or they're, they're killing your soldiers. So it's a survivability piece, right? So 
that entire architecture is is built around the requirements that deliver suitable, effective, and survivable material candidate solutions and material solutions really that are that end state, that product that the warfighter is going to take. And all that's transparent to them. It should be transparent to them. They shouldn't be thinking about that when they're in a foxhole. They shouldn't be thinking about that when they're getting ready to do an airborne op. It's like, I have a piece of materiel, it's sound, and I'm going to survive if I use it to close with and destroy the enemy. So let's let's get like a little more granular, granular okay. here, right? Um, what do you think a couple of the most critical advancements you've seen technologically in the last couple of years that are going to help define the next generation of small UAS? That's a big one. Um, I, I keep going back to the survivability piece. You hear a lot of people saying like, well, I can get this drone for $450 at Radio Shack. Mm-hmm. That's not capability. That's, that's kit. You just heard me say suitable, effective, survivable. Um, so the survivability piece is that the system survivability in an EW degraded, denied uh, environment is that the operator survivability. If you look at any, any form of open source intelligence coming out of Russia and Ukraine, the number one thing targeted on the battlefield is the small UAS operator. So Pilots. yeah, it's a, it's a huge uh, injustice to give our warfighters who are supposed to fight in a doctrinal overmatch ratio of three to one. Like that's how we always fight three to one. You and me go to a bar, six guys come against us and we break contact. We come back and get the rest of your crew. And then we go back with, with numbers, right? Um, software. I think software is going to be the biggest piece. And I know you want to talk about swarm stuff later. I think the uh, collaborative, autonomous, multi-agent behaviors, the ability to not only um, achieve mass, but concentration of effects. Um, my boss, uh, Dom Edwards, always says, you know, what, what robots do is moderately interesting. It's the effects they help commanders achieve on the battlefield that is the compelling component of the entire like joint swaths or robotic uh, enabled maneuver strategy. Um, so piecing all that together and then mm-hmm. having integration and interoperability not I have this system and it doesn't talk to this system and I'm I'm seeing with EOIR sensors across multiple forms of modalities um, with that sensor, but I can't communicate that to a shooter. So that's why our strategy is a hunter and a killer strategy that mm-hmm. nests um, mm-hmm. with our proponent with launched effects, uh, rotary wing, fixed wing, and then then at the tactical echelon, preponderance of systems, then feeding the operational and strategic um, uh, levels of warfare. Um, it's going to be amazing to see where this, this morphs, you know, I retire in six months and then I'm going to be on the outside looking in and it's going to be really interesting to see these, um, new capabilities get fielded. How are they used? What are the likes? What are the dislikes? And then see if I've done my job and I hand, hand the baton off in the race, right? If the dude that replaces, replaces me takes that and then he's able to like keep climbing the ladder and we just keep incrementally getting better and better and better with these capabilities, you know? It's like Palmer Lucky said uh, last week on the Sean Ryan show, like make Skynet, just don't give Skynet the nuclear codes, right? So um, we want to be 10 times more lethal, um, get back to having that decisive overmatch and then utilize these capabilities um, in partnership with industry, the DEVCOM armament center, the requirements folks, like it's the entirety of the system. It's not an us against you mentality in here. It's a team of teams, right? A coalition of the willing. Um, I can't tell you how many times I heard a time and place of the enemy's choosing. A time and place of the enemy's choosing. Now, through robotic enabled maneuver, it'll be a time and place of our choosing. Mm-hmm. Commanders are starting to embrace this because they know too. You know, they're not they're not new to the game, right? They've been to the two way petting zoo. They know you can pet the tiger, but the tiger pets back, pets back really hard, right? Um, so you just take everything we do, and this is why the United States is the best, uh, I think, warfighter warfighting machine the world's ever seen. Thanks for listening to the Drone Wars podcast. Each week, we bring you fascinating conversations with leaders shaping the future of air, sea, land, and space technologies. Catch new episodes every Tuesday wherever podcasts can be found. Until then, we'll see you next time.